Good. So nice to see so many students. I'm not sure if everyone will survive till the end, but I hope most of you will. Uh, it's a it's a somewhat unusual set of lectures on quantum mechanics. And in some sense, I really rely on the fact that each of you attended some detailed introductory course in quantum mechanics. So it is by no means an attempt to, to really provide a complete knowledge of the theory, or even uh, all in particular, and make sure that you are able to solve standard uh, problems in quantum mechanics. This, I, I believe, all of you know how to do. However, on the other hand, I plan at least to start this series of lectures in some sense assuming that I have to tell you from the very beginning what is quantum mechanics. Since it will be rapid and it will be like some, in some sense rather abstract language, of course, the only, almost the only way that I can believe that you understand is by, by also assuming or knowing that you know a lot about quantum mechanics. So, our starting point and the first remark I want to make is that large part of physics and various aspects, various areas of physics, deal with the dynamics, with the, with the, with, predict, uh, with predicting a future of some systems. So dynamical theory. Is, is something that needs two ingredients. They need specification of the notion of state, set of initial conditions, Thank 
matter in quantum mechanics if we are invoking a form of evolution equations as canonical equations. So in other words, we need to know Hamiltonian and what are the ingredients, these external agents that are needed to set a given problem. Of course, these are, well, in, in Newtonian language forces, but again, getting closer to quantum mechanical situation, I would say external potentials. And of course, if there are many particles, then mutual interactions, but they are also typically uh, nicely described if they are potential forces. As you know, friction cannot be described by potential. And so, friction is not really well suited for canonical formulation. Forget it. So clearly, we can, if we identify these ingredients in classical mechanics, another also classic example is, of course, Maxwell electrodynamics. And here, initial condition, again, notion of a state of a system is obviously. knowing both electric and magnetic fields everywhere in space, but at initial moment, of course. This is the set of initial conditions for, the, for these partial differential equations that are called Maxwell equations. The equation of motion, of course, are these Maxwell equations, that's clear. And what are these external agents? Well, these external agents in this case is charges. And currents. So again, the same three elements can be easily identified in, in classical electrodynamics. The uniqueness, I say, dynamical theory is about predicting the future. Uniqueness here, well, means that these are the sufficiently precise initial conditions that, given the Hamiltonian, given our skills, maybe in numerics, we are able to predict the state of the system, namely, again, positions and momenta at later time. Similarly here, had we known uh, the field amplitudes, E and V everywhere, given those external agents, in principle, we, we should be able to solve maximum equations for the later times, so we can map this into some final, final values of, of the fields. So, uh, with this almost trivial remarks, we can now turn to quantum mechanics, which is another example of a dynamical theory. So quantum mechanics is again an example, a very important example of dynamical theory. And of course, we have to begin with identifying the state. And what's the state? State is the element of the Hilbert space, which has a one normalization property, namely that the, its length is equal to 1. Now what is Hilbert space? Almost everyone knows. It's a linear, complex linear vector space equipped with the scalar product. So what does it mean it's linear? Well, it means that if psi and Phi are two and both elements of a Hilbert space, then so is this combination. Yes. That object also belongs. That means that it's a linear vector space. Coefficients alpha and beta can be complex, so it's a complex space. 
as I say, equal to the scalar product, what should we assume about scalar product is that it is several things, in particular that it is linear in the second argument and anti-linear in the third, in the first. In other words, that this is the same as alpha star beta times psi phi. Yeah? That's the by the way, physics differs from mathematics in this respect, because mathematicians assume this complex conjugation in the second element of a, of a scalar product. It's not the only way, it's the only difference between physics and math, but one of them. One of them. Okay, now, important is the norm. So the norm is the square root of psi psi of the scale of the scalar product of, of the vector with itself. And this condition that we have is the condition of the norm, that the norm must be equal to one for psi, in other words, for psi being being a state. In other words, our states do not span all of the Hilbert space. They span like a unit hypercircle in this space. Yes, These are only vectors of unit length which really represent states. Now, if we have a vector space of this kind, uh, one more obvious remark, the scalar product in this situation is always must be always greater than equal to zero if a norm of some vector in the Hilbert space is equal to zero then almost by definition it means that the state itself is zero so nothing like I don't know Minkowski space or something where, where there is a signature and some vectors would have negative length negative Okay, now, once we remember, everyone knows of course what I'm saying now, remember about these properties of the silver space, then we can think of, of the basis. The basis these are unit vectors of 
the type that are useful for physics. Those that are useful are called separable Hilbert spaces. In Polish, Oshlotkowe, Przestrzeni Hilbert. And separable Hilbert space is the one for which there is a countable orthonormal basis. And as far as we can tell, until somebody comes with, it, with extension or generalization, quantum mechanics as we know it requires only separable Hilbert spaces. So in other words, there's only one step at this point from this finite dimensional spaces and infinitely many dimensional spaces of use in quantum mechanics. Namely, that such sums in one case are finite, in the other are infinite. Good. Now, of course, if this fellow is also a normal basis, then by projecting it at j and using the orthonormality of the basis, we immediately get, of course, a formula for lambda j, and that's the ej times psi. It's just a projection. It's a very handy expression. If I plug in this fellow here, then I will get another very simple formula for, for the, this expansion. Namely, I will get, for some reason, let me put it this way. So this number, this lambda I put to the right, not to the left, it doesn't matter, of course. Okay, so this is nice expression explicitly showing the expansion of, a, of some state in the orthonormal basis. And somewhat symbolically, I can, I can view it, this right side in the following way. This is a linear mapping of psi on EI. It's like acting with some operator on psi. The result is in, in direction of EI, and the argument of this operator is psi. So it is a nice way of symbolically writing operator of this sort. It's very easy to, to see that pi squared, just because these guys are orthonormal, is the same as pi, yes? Because if I just multiply it, then one scalar product is just equal to one, the one in the middle. Yeah. So in other words, this is a very special operator. It satisfies this condition. Such operators that satisfy this condition are called projectors. That's a projector. This operator which takes any element of the Hilbert space and projects it on, on direction EI. Yes. So if I would write this formula here in this form sum PI operators over I times psi, then I can, from here, I can learn that if this is identi identity for any psi, then sum of pi is just the identity operator. That's sometimes called completeness relation <coughs> of the basis. It's the same as, as telling what I was telling at the very beginning, that I've got orthonormal is such that every state can be expanded. It's the same as saying that the sum of these projectors is just equal to the unit Now, one more remark concerning this seeming, seeming triviality. Thank you. 
dimension of space that is some which lasts from like from 1 to n. Then the fact that I have a state which is normalized to 1 upon the substitution immediately is just the sum of lambda i squared over i. So in other words, first of all, this expression tells me that, I'm sorry, so in other words, this expression tells me that the knowledge of psi, given some basis of course, knowledge of psi is exactly the same as knowledge of all these complex lambda coefficients. If I have a set of these lambda coefficients, I can, I can plug it in and, and reproduce psi. Or if I have psi, I can compute these lambdas through this expression with projections. So it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. And these lambda i's, they are spanning just standard n-dimensional vector space of little columns, yes, lambda 1 up to lambda n. And that's a standard vector space, finite dimensional vector space the way we all know it. So in some sense that is, if I say finite, finite, finite dimensional Hilbert space, then I can mean this because it's not, I'm not losing any generality. Every finite dimensional space can be viewed as such a column vector. Yes. And versos could be chosen as 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on. Yeah. There's nothing more general. Moreover, if I am in this nasty and ambitious infinitely many dimensional space, then everything holds true still, except that there is no n but just infinite uh, vector with infinitely many components. Yes. So this is in a very simple way explanation of the relatively powerful theory in functional analysis, which says that there is isomorphism between any separable Hilbert space and this space of square integrable vectors. Of course, if I have infinity here, then of course this must be finite, obviously. Yes. So, that's it. This space of these lambdas going to infinity in, in textbooks is called little l squared. So everything physicists do, whatever they claim is, even in quantum field theory, at the end is nothing more than playing a game in the little l square space. So we almost know everything. Yes. Good. So, the next point is dynamical variables in quantum mechanics. Once we have a vector space like a Hilbert space, then it is kind of obvious that the important role is played by mapping, by especially linear mapping of vectors of this space into itself. These linear operators are, are, are of great relevance and importance here. So we are we say that we have such operator if we know how to apply it to the states. And the result, and that is not a completely trivial statement, is again remember if we are in this finite dimensional space, then there is really nothing special, nothing fundamental in this restriction of this remark and that and after upon acting with the operator on psi, then you should be again in the Hilbert space. However, in infinitely many dimensional space, it's slightly more complicated. Why? Because, for instance, we all know that the position operator in the standard Schrodinger 
their representation is just multiplication by x. Yes? So if I have a wave function psi of x, in order to, for this uh, wave function to belong to the capital L square over R, namely this uh, space of square integrable functions, yes, it must satisfy that this should this object should exist from minus to plus infinity. Well, what it is, it is of course some condition on many things, but in particular some condition for the fall off of this function at infinity. Otherwise, this integral would not exist. Yes. Ah, you can you, you can easily check that it must fall off what faster than. However, if I multiply this guy by x, and this is a nice properly falling off function, then if it is just at the edge, then after, upon multiplication by x, it will make our integral divergent. No good. What does it mean? Well, it means that in, in this infinitely many dimensional Hilbert spaces, there is a lot of operators which, as we know, are, well, as we call, are unbounded. For such operators, even though physicists typically do not care at all about these mathematical details, mathematicians would tell us that knowing how the guy acts on some specific function is not enough. One also has to specify what is called domain. So the operator, unlike for, for finite dimensional spaces where there is no such refinement either, for infinitely many dimensional spaces, there is a lot of operators, and we deal with these operators daily, for which, from the strictly mathematical point of view, it's not enough to tell how A acts, but also we have to specify domain, namely set of vectors for which we know how it acts. And this D is strictly smaller than the whole Hilbert space. It has some consequences. Typically, I would say we don't care about these consequences and we go away with this carelessness, no problem. But once in a while, <coughs> one better remembers about this domain. And Today, I plan to spend maybe last half an hour or 20 minutes of the lecture showing you one not completely unrealistic or unimportant example of a situation where this problem of domain is really essential. Specifying domain and then thinking about it. Good. Now, but now go back to the matrices, yes? I should say, go back to the finite dimensional spaces and linear mapping of finite dimensional vector space into itself. Okay. Now, to know how this fellow acts on any vector, it is obviously sufficient to know how this fellow acts on all the basis states. Once we know this, we can always look at this decomposition of psi and then act term by term. Good. Now, if so, then we can also think of expanding this guy again in the basis. Well, expanding because it's another vector in our Hilbert space. So this fellow would have expansion into Ej. Now, what are the expansion coefficients? Well, they of course depend on A and should have two uh, uh, indices, yes, I and J.
from this construction, it is, I think, clear that whatever the abstract definition of A is, provided it is abstract but, but, but well defined, something that tells us how to act on vectors of psi, it's, a, it's exactly the same as knowing what is called the matrix elements of this vector. So, by properly multiplying from both sides, it is clear that this fellow is nothing else but the element of vector of operator A between two basis vectors. So really, all there is to it when we when we are talking about finite dimensional spaces is that we have to think of operators, and of course, of course without saying that operators are very important because dynamical variables will be will be described by operators in quantum mechanics, is to know all the matrix elements. That's it. Now, very important from a physics point of view, very important notion here is the notion of Hermitian conjugation. And this, as you of course know, goes by this equation. Yes. Right? So this equation defines us Hermitian conjugate basis. And just skipping one line of my notes, I think everyone knows that by again using the basis on both sides, one immediately gets that ij of a Hermitian conjugate matrix is uh, ji. So one has to, to, to do two operations. One is transposition, the other complex conjugation. And that's, the, that's how you define this Hermitian conjugate. Why this Hermitian conjugation is so important? Well, because of particular physical interest are matrices or are operators for which matrices are Hermitian. In other words, for which A dagger is exactly equal to A. Why these guys are so nice and relevant and important? Well, I think everyone knows if matrix is Hermitian, then if I do what we in quantum mechanics have to do very often, in other words, if you ask what is the spectrum or a set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, so eigenvalue equation is So if you, if, you, if you have eigenvalue problem of this sort, then first, if A is Hermitian, the A's are real. Yeah. How do we see it? Well, it's very easy. I also, well, uh, and the second thing is that these EIs are spanning a orthonormal base. That's slightly more, slightly longer to, to prove, but I'm sure that you, you have, each of you have seen such a proof uh, in algebra. So di is orthonormal basis. Well, that's, the fact that these guys are real is very easy to check. If I take my eigenvector E i act with A and then project back at E i, then because it's uh, I, because it's an eigenvector, then I get E i, sorry, A i, E i, E i, and this is of course one. So then I get i, yes. But on the other hand, I can put this fellow here in first instance, I would put Hermitian conjugate, but I know that my matrix of my operator is Hermitian, so I can draw this cross. 
again, I can use my eigen equation, which is satisfied by the I. However, now on this side, I will get the I complex conjugate, because I now pull the coefficient from the left, from the first argument, yes? Times again one. However, this and this guys are equal because I, knew I was using only two simple operations. One is take, taking this fellow and going here, and then using Hermitian conjugation. Sorry, Hermeticity of the operator. Therefore, this fellow must be equal to this, and so it is real. Everyone probably would do this little exercise himself without, without me repeating it. One part of the proof that that that, this, that the eigen vectors, which correspond to different eigenvalues, are mutually orthogonal, is also very easy to check. For instance, we've got a times e equals a times e, and we've got a times f equals b times f. Yeah? So if I take now and a is different than b, so these are eigenvectors corresponding to different eigenvalues, then of course I can easily check that if I take f, a, e, then I will get a times f while if I take A F E yes, then I will take and then I will get B which is I know is real so I can pull it out times F E and on the other hand these two things are equal because again I have a Hermitian operator and I can jump from left to right and from right to left Therefore, these guys are equal, so this should be equal. A is different than B, so how come they can be equal? Well, only because this fellow is equal to zero. This is very simple proof of, 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 of part of this full theorem. Uh, completeness is slightly more complicated, but I, and I will not go into detail, but I'm sure that you have seen it proved uh, in some algebra lecture. There is also a little bit of a complication if there is so-called degeneracy. In other words, if there, are, there is more than one eigenvector which belongs to, to the same eigenvalue, but then again I, I will not talk more about these trivialities. Okay? Now, something almost trivial. However, good to know that it is so. If I have A for which I know full expression, full spectral analysis, yes, if I know full spectral analysis, then if I have a square, then I twice act with my a on this vector, and I immediately get this fellow, trivial. But the non-trivial is, well, not completely trivial, is a very simple generalization. First, if I have any power, then this is ei to the nth power times the i. Yes, of course. And therefore, if I have any, and absolutely any, analytic function of a, so function of the operator, for which I know how to expand it on the power series, then working term by term, term by term, term by term, of course, I will immediately get 
that for any such analytic function, these guys are still eigenvectors, and the eigenvalues are simply the same function applied to eigenvalues. What? Um, question. Now, I have a question. How it is, it is not obvious that we can do that. Why? Because some series, for example, for I can converge and for, for I can Sure, uh, if I, but don't forget that I've used a very specific way for any analytic function. Yes. So only for the convergent series. In other words, if left blows up, then the right blows up as well, yes? If it's well, if this is reasonable, then this is very reasonable and that defines this on every uh, version of the basis. Therefore, I can apply it to any state, of course, due to the linearity and completeness of these guys. Okay. As you know, I know also. One of the most important variables in quantum mechanics is called the Hamiltonian. Why? Because we can tell, I can tell you something, a well kept secret, that we also know the evolution equation, the second ingredient of the theory, and that's called the Schrodinger equation, yes? So, we know that state changes in time by the action of some Hermitian operator. Now, there is very simple, even though it's not really very explicit, solution to this equation, namely function of a Hamiltonian, function which actually is analytic, therefore <coughs> this operator can be handled with care but without big nature. That's called evolution operator. Evolution operators the family which is called unitary operator. It's an example of unitary operators. By definition, unitary operators are not Hermitian typically, but they have a property that u to minus 1 is the same as u conjugate. Well, indeed, all, all there is to it to conjugate this fellow is to replace i by minus i. And on the other, on the other hand, if, this, if I multiply this fellow by, what well, if you, I don't care, taking Hermitian conjugate to this fellow, since this is Hermitian, also amounts to changing i to plus i. So this equation is of course satisfied. This unitary operators being nice exponential functions of Hermitian operator, H Hamiltonian is of course assumed Hermitian standard uh, application, uh, applications in quantum mechanics. Now this being Hermitian, that makes it unitary, and this being Hermitian having real eigenvalues, if I look at this, exp at, at this expression here, means that eigenvalues of the evolution equation are also special. They, they of course, are in the general complex, but they are, but if, if energies of some kind appear as eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, then clearly eigenvalues of this equation, of, of the evolution equation, are of the form E, E, T over H bar. In other words, they have they rely on a unit circle. It's also very special. Yeah. Okay. Now, I already told you, without telling you what Hamiltonian is, of course you know, and it depends on this on this force. 
size of these potentials and so on. So this is really the evolution equation that I said it's needed. And there is one more thing which we have to invoke and that you also very, know very well, namely the observation postulate, which says something like this. If I am measuring quantity, which is represented in quantum mechanics by operator A, then the only results of single measurements are the eigenvalues. I can't get anything else but eigenvalues. And the probability of getting eigenvalue lambda, so I have A, so many lambdas get an A I. Probability of getting a given eigenvalue if my state is psi, well that is given by the square of the scalar product of psi. So this modulus square, that's a probability of finding eigenvalue. I, I was using capital P for projections. I will try to write small p if I'm able to. This will be yes. Now, this is postulate, very important postulate, which is linking the formalism to the observations. And due to the fact that, of course, we, we remember that this psi should have unit length, if I sum this probability over i, over all possible directions, then of course I get unity, yes? If I take sum over i psi e i times complex conjugate, which is of course this, and then use this completeness relation, then I get the same as psi Psi, I get unity. So these guys really deserve the name probability because they add up to, to unity. Now, so if I have this state Psi, I have these probabilities P, then it's not, no longer a possibility that follows that if I have many identical copies of my system and I check the value here, 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 of this quantity A, then with this prob probability PI, I will get AI value. So that's a distribution of these values measurements, you know, values results of the measurements. And that allows me to define the mean value. So the mean value of the operator A in state Psi yes, is nothing else but sum over these probabilities pi times ai. Now this, of course, upon introducing what, what this fellow is and summing over, is nothing as, as what you know is just this one. We are, we are used to call, uh, we are used to call the Expectation value. Now, question: Do we want a break? Who wants a break? Who does not want a break? So, others abstain. So, since there were some votes against break, there will be no break. And you can change your mind next week if you feel uh, towards uh, to the end of today's lecture too tired that we can make break. Next week. Okay, so let's, let me continue. Now, another important fact, and again something that you know probably quite well, is, is this very important notion of commutativity. Suppose we've got
very important another operator, which is called the commutator, which by definition is, as we know, A times B minus B times A. And the theorem that you all know very well is, says that commutator equal to zero is exactly the same as saying that for both these operators I can construct one autonomous base which will be universal, which will be well, for both, yes? So, common basis of eigenvectors. Well, in, in this direction, I think it is proof is in one line. If there is a common basis, in, a, in other words, there is a base in the Hilbert space for which A, A acting gives A i and B acting on the same vectors gives B i B i. So then I can act on any basis vector with the commutator and use these two formulas and then of course I will get zero because it will boil down to the fact that this numbers A and B commute. So then it follows in DP if this is zero. In the other direction, typically the uh, proof consists of two steps. Let me just invoke, invoke only one step. So take basis associated with, with first of these guys. Now my assumption is that they commute, yes? That A times B is equal to B times A. That's my assumption now. Yeah. So now, let me take A times B and act on EI. Well, I don't know how this fellow acts on this, but I know that they commute, so I can rewrite it in the form B times A times E. Ah, here is better, because I know that this is like a vector. That's a number, a real number, so this is the same as A, I, B, E, I. And now, looking at the beginning and at the end, I see that not only E, I itself is an eigenstate which belongs to this eigenvalue, but also the same state acted upon with the matrix B remains an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue. Now, it is one little step that, that I will omit. Let me assume, for, for my version of the very simplified proof, that there is no degeneracy. In other words, that there is only one vector that satisfies this equation with this eigenvalue. Now, if so, then it means that B acting on EI reproduces EI with some coefficient, which is, of course, eigenvalue. And that's it, yes. It is slightly more complicated if, if some eigenvalue A is degenerate, so there is more than one E that satisfies this. From then, you, from this uh, reasoning, you could not immediately claim that, that this is proportional, but you can still claim that this uh, that, that acting with P on E I is certainly lying in the subspace spanned by these several eigenvectors that belong to the eigenvalue A I. And now it's only a question of rotating the basis in the subspace to really satisfy the fact that P is also uh, acting on E I slightly modified EI is, 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 is an eigenvalue. Okay, now, let me now jump to, to this risky business of infinitely many dimensional spaces. And let's 
take this x operator acting on psi x, that's operator, yes? And now I want to solve my eigenvalue problem. I have nothing else to do but to write some eigenvalue times this psi x of x. What is this? How do I solve such a question? Well, among square integrable functions, there is no solution. But there is a solution within distributions. Solution to this equation is delta of x minus x0, right? In other words, once we are in the infinite, in the infinitely many dimensional space, unfortunately, we have to be slightly more generous to the eigenvalue problem. Very often, our eigenvectors will not belong to the Hilbert space. Same with the momentum operator, yes? H bar over I, d psi by d, d psi by dx equal p psi. That, of course, gives me psi in the form of by some constant, here also some constant, times e to i, i over h bar p times x. Yes. This is, of course, also not square integral function. Its module is equal to 1 or to some coefficient everywhere. I cannot square it and integrate it from minus to plus infinity. So it is quite all typical that these unbounded operators would have some eigenvectors which are not members of the Hilbert space. It's very unpleasant. Physicists usually do not think about it, but it's better to know. Actually, if I have finite dimensional matrices, then of course I have well-spaced gapped set of eigenvalues. It's called point spectrum. If I have this unpleasant infinite, uh, unbounded operators, then quite often spectrum is continuous. Part of it is continuous. And it is just eigenvectors that belong to the points in the continuous spectrum that are not members of the Hilbert space. They lie outside. There is nice little aspect to it. If I plug in such an unpleasant eigenvector of unbounded operator and try to compute the scalar product with the descent vector, then this is finite. This is a very finite number. And in these two important cases, it's obvious. If I take delta of x minus x naught times psi of x dx, yes? To compute the scalar product, I could write the uh, compact circuit, but it's a real function. And indeed, I get a nice, I simply get value, value of my function at x0. And that's a very nice number. Very similar, you know, well, very similar with, with this integral. Because this is simply a Fourier transform. If I am in L, L squared, then Fourier transform is a very nice function. So you can always compute this scalar product between these generalized eigenvectors, as some people call it, and the nice states. Yeah, that's fine. There is even a theorem which is, in some sense, almost trivial extension of, of the completeness relation that we had in the finite dimensional spaces. And these theorems you are, of course, encountered studying uh, analysis. For instance, for the Fourier transform, this is called fourier planchel equality. I don't want to go into detail. If you do not remember, just check your old notes in mathematical analysis of calculus, and I'm sure you will find it in the, in the section about Fourier transforms. So, 
we have to go a bit further, but not very far, yes, because many limitations that are easily proved and are rigorously correct for finite dimensional spaces are modified only slightly if we go to the infinite dimensional space and to unbounded operators. Okay? Now let me see, I have, I'm slowly coming to my only surprising thing for most of you. But let me check if I covered everything that I wanted to cover before. So now, ah, well, okay, okay. Now I come to something that I believe, I can never be sure, but I believe none of you have before. And that is this problem of, of domains for the infinitely many dimensional space. Imagine that we deal with a situation, and this is quite often discussed in the in problems in quantum mechanics, of the infinite square well potential. So here goes to infinity, here goes infinity, and zero otherwise, yes? And this point I will call zero, this point I will call one. And we all know, we are used to that the momentum operator, for some reason, for the reason that will be clear in a moment, I will call it P naught, acting on psi computed at a given point is nothing else but h bar divided by i d psi by dx. Well, you know, it's in one dimension. However, I told you that with this infinite many dimensional spaces, I sometimes have to think about domain. So let me, in other words, it's a pair. How do I act and on what can I act? And imagine that my P0 is defined with a domain of a functions that vanish at both endpoints. Not unphysical. We know that typically these are the conditions for the wave function if we are dealing with infinitely high square well. Yeah? Okay, now let's see what are the properties of this vector, this operator defined this way, from the point of view of hermeticity. Okay? And how do I check? When I take integral from 0 to 1, I take some function phi star of x, and now I put this p naught. I will do it right away. h bar over i times d psi by dx. And now, for this hermeticity trick, what do I do? Well, of course, I integrate my paths. Integrating by parts, I will jump with this derivative on this, but of course there is this minus sign, you remember. But physicists remembered about it and they introduced i here. So under the, this fellow, upon integration, we will get integral from minus 1 to plus 1 times h bar over i d psi, I was called phi, complex conjugate, then psi, ah, but it's not all. We have to add here these end terms, yes, when we integrate by parts. And what are they? Well, it is, it is phi of star of 1, psi of 1, minus phi star of 0, psi of 0. Now, okay, you could say some h bar. Some h bar. Yes. 
some age battle with pucks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Age battle with an eye somewhere, yes? But maybe even I have made a mistake in the sign of it. No, it's correct. It's correct. Okay, now I look at this expression and I see, aha, very nice, this complex conjugation, uh, this Hermitian conjugation gets me exactly the same operator. If my psi satisfies this condition that this is zero and this is zero. And of course, if this fellow is equal to this and equal to zero as well, but this is unnecessary. Yeah? So, if both psi and phi belong to the domain of my P0, then I get the same result. Yes? Then I, I'm really jumping back and forth. This mathematician is called symmetry. Such operator is called symmetric. However, my jumping from differentiation of this onto differentiation, uh, differentiation of this provides vanishing this term if psi of 1 and at psi of 0 is equal to 0, regardless what are the values of the other wave, wave function. In other words, I will have this fellow vanishing for more phi's than belong to this domain. In some jargon, mathematicians would say that the conjugate of p naught is not really identical to p naught is bigger because it has bigger domain. So, P naught Hermitian conjugate, people sometimes, mathematicians sometimes write this way, is bigger than P naught. If, if restricted to the domain of P naught, it is identical. But it can be applied, its domain is larger, it can be applied to some vectors that do not belong to the defined by us domain of this fellow. I am sure that if you remember some recitations, some of these problem sessions from your early days in quantum mechanics, the assistant would typically not go into such details, would say, okay, upon integrating by part, you see that it is identical, so it's a Hermitian operator, and we are happy. Well, are we happy? If really this is a domain, and if I would now ask what are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this equation, then what do I get? I get h bar over i d psi by dx equal p naught psi, which of course has a solution psi equals some constant times e to i p naught x over h bar and I swear this fellow cannot vanish both at 0 and 1. Yeah? Of course it has, it has uh, absolute uh, value is equal to 1, yes? So it cannot be 0. What does it mean? It means that in this domain, in this domain, this operator has no eigenvalues at all, let alone defining new basis and stuff, everything we, we like so much. Message? Well, if you have such a problem, and someone asks you, what are the properties of a momentum there? Say, none. Should we be concerned as physicists, really concerned or scared? Well, not necessarily, because nobody has ever built infinity, infinite walls. Yeah. And if wall is finite, then we are having really the uh, Hilbert space on the whole line. Yeah? And then all the solutions right at the bottom would fall off properly and so on. And the condition would not be at zero and one, but at infinities. However, let's be academic. Let's think about what can we do 
to restore nice properties to this differential operator. Okay? Here is what? How? What? Here is what we can do. Let me keep this very important equation. And now let's define P without any naught acting on Psi evaluated at point X with a formula exactly like the one before. However, with domain that consists of functions which are periodic. And this fellow is equal to this. Plug in 
of psi 1 as e to i alpha times psi of 0, take out psi of 0 again, and for vanishing of this fellow, I will get phi star e to i alpha of 1 equal phi star of 0. If I take it under, this, uh, under the If I take, uh, sorry, but I multiply it uh, by e to minus, in other words, if I can write this way, phi star of 1 equal e to minus i alpha phi of 0. And now if I conjugate, then I will get phi of 1 is equal same formula for phi. So this is another extension. Actually, it's infinitely continuum of extensions. Yeah. And they are still OK, because condition that defines the domain on the, in the right factor in the scalar product is exactly the same as the one on the left. So again, there is equality between these guys, and I get alternative condition. Yes. Among them, of course, there is previous one for alpha equals zero. That's clear. Are these different really operators with this alpha? The answer is yes. Again, look at the eigenvalue problem. We know that the solution is like this. Now I, I have to look for my solution in this domain. And what I get is over h bar. What I get is e to i p over h bar equals e to i alpha oh, times, times 1. Yes. Times now this fellow, of course, has nice solutions, namely p n over h bar is equal to alpha plus 2 pi n. Huh. If alpha happens not to be multiple of 2 pi, I am getting completely different spectrum. Shift. Yeah. So these are some of the traps that one can fall in sometimes by forgetting that in quantum mechanics, Domains are sometimes relevant. Quite often, and this is not the case here, this is just a counterexample that I've shown you here. Quite often, if we are somehow too restrictive and we are in this situation, there is a so called unique uh, self enjoined extension. In full blown functional analysis, this notion equality, that A is equal to A, that's what typically in algebra we call hermeticity, is called self-adjointness, self-adjointness. So I go back, sometimes for some problems, if, if, even if there is some difficulty in, in this domain business, there is unique self-adjoint extension. If, if this is so, then typically physicists would not make a mistake. Would probably blindly choose this extension without thinking much. What I, I have shown on this example, which is very old, which comes from, from a very famous guy, John von Neumann, from early days of quantum mechanics. What I have shown on this example is that sometimes there is a whole family of extensions and they are really inequivalent because they have different spectra. They are self-adjoint, they are neat, and of course for alpha not equal to zero, typically they are completely useless, because as I say, physically, typically the, uh, the periodic boundary conditions are either rightly assumed or, 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 or consciously assumed by, by, by a student or by, even by professors sometimes. Now, I want to add with the little homework. Let's take the same problem 
other words, typical domain that we are looking at are functions that vanish at both ends. And please do show that the kinetic energy operator, namely P squared, is actually reasonably self -adjoint. There is no problem and there is no way that, that we can have non-trivial extension to self -adjoints. So momentum makes no sense, but the energy fortunately makes sense. And of course if you look back in your memory to the old times when you had when you've been solving such problems, they always ask what are the energy eigenvalues, not about what are the momenta. Yes. Knowing or not knowing why asking for momenta makes no sense. Uh, usually not knowing why asking for momenta makes no sense. I think this is really very, very, very first introductory lecture that I want to finish at this point. I want to say also that from time to time, we will also offer recitations as they are on the device. And in most places in Europe there are problem sessions. And I will, if, if we had such opportunity, then I will ask Rafael to meet uh, to solve one or two problems for, with you. Or sometimes to, to fill up the gap in some derivation that I'm going through very quickly here. So from time to time we will ask you assembled on some other occasion, or in one case, and I can even tell you right now, uh, I think it's March 23rd, if I'm not mistaken, I will be away, and then I will make sure that he has something to tell you, maybe also to record. <laughs>